All right, so next, uh, Gerald is going to talk about some computer forensic stuff. How many people do forensics here? I do. I do, yeah. Um, and uh, pass the hash tags. How many people have used pass the hash before? I raised that other hand. Yeah, all right. So look to your left, look to your right. Everybody's got a reason to listen to this. Um, this is, this is going to be pretty interesting. Um, and uh, bonus, this is a Linux laptop that hooked up the projector the first time. That's big. That's big. Can't believe that. All right, let's give Gerald a big hand. Okay, hi, my name is Gerard Leige. I'm here to talk about forensic artifacts from a patch to hash attack. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank the organizer of DEF CON for allowing me to present this topic at DEF CON 23. Um, standard disclaimer <laughs> the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and does not necessarily represent the official policy. The, the official policy or position of the company that the author works for. So I have to read this <laughs> in order to present. Okay, so what's a hash? Uh, basically, hash functions, uh, the hash function is any function that can be used to map digital data of arbitrary size to digital data of fixed size. In the case of Windows, a password is stored in either a landman hash or an NTLM hash format. Okay? So basically, um, you know, you type in your password, the password is not stored uh, on the system in plain text. What happens is it's converted to a hash function, you know, a hash function goes through it, and that's what's saved in your system. So basically, hash equals password. Uh, where are the hashes stored? Um, there are a bunch of places where they're stored, um, and here they are. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to read it for you guys. <laughs> okay, so for so here's some of the examples. So the best example that I've ever heard of, you know, hashes. And what they, you know, like what they look like in the real world would be like the coffee cup. Uh, I, you know, when I was doing my CISSP, uh, Sean Harris talked about this, where you get a coffee cup. That's your plain text password. When you drop it, that, that's the mathematical function that it's going through. When it hits the ground, that's your hash. So when you log into a Windows system, it's not comparing your coffee cups. It's comparing those splats on the ground. If the splats on the ground match. You're in. Okay. So pass the hash. So this uh, patch to hash is a hacking technique that allows an attacker to authenticate to a remote server service by underlying by using the underlying NTLM or landman hash of a user's password instead of requiring the, the associated plain text password. Like I said before, in this case, hash is equal to password. If you can get your hands on that hash, you really don't need that person's password. So one of the things that I've done in my de uh, my demo environment was I did a bunch of logging changes. Out of the box, if you do not change the logging, you will not catch anything. Microsoft even goes as far as to tell you that. Uh, I actually, that's why I actually included the KB article that says this. So basically they give you, hey, you know, you might want to turn this on, you might want to turn that on, because if you don't, you're not going to catch anything. So a lot of these uh, artifacts that I'm going to show you guys, some of them don't even appear unless you turn on this, you know, this logging. And the logging that you turn on really doesn't add that much to your logs. And also because you're going to um, put more stuff in your logs, you need to increase the log file size. And Microsoft also gives recommendations on that. Okay, so um, in my demo domain, I was going to do a live demo, but the problem is the screen size is, is not going to work. But then so uh, the demo that I have though, um, I will show a video. In it, it's a Windows 2012 native mode domain. So for people that are admins out there, it's native mode. That means the LM hash, don't even use that. That hash is weak. So it's, this is NTLM. Uh, the domain name is onos.internal. So for this one over here, you're going to see uh, the boxes that I'm going to be playing with are the Windows 7 client, the member server, uh, is Win2K, uh, Win2K8 R2, and Win2K12 domain controller. There's going to be a user called I'm a user. He has, he basically has access to uh, the client box and he's the admin on the client box and he's also an admin for an application on the member server. This is like a lot of people out there. A lot of corporations, a lot of businesses have users that have to administer applications on servers. So this is, you know, this is, this is what's out there. 
the I'm a domain admin, even though he has access to all the stuff in the domain, usually you'll see him on the Win2K domain, uh, you'll see him on the domain controllers, and every now and then you'll see him on the, the domain servers, on the uh, member servers rather. That might look cool because you're saving, you know, you don't have to make a separate account, but for this attack, this is what's going to catch you is your domain admin doing work on a member server. It's that intersection that you get caught. Also, for people have, that have been small, medium, or even large co uh, corporations, what happens is that they have what they call a golden image. On this golden image, what they do is they have the same local admin password. So for all these clients out there, hey, they have the same, uh, we call it the SID 500. That's the, you know, if you look in uh, Microsoft stuff for well-known SIDs, anything that has the 500 pre uh, at the end of it, that's the administrator account. So what you could probably do is that, I'm going to show it to you later on when I dump the hashes. You're going to see an account that says administrator but he, do he doesn't have 500 on it. And there's going to be another account with my name on it that has 500 on it. So the one that has my name on it, that's the real local administrator account that's just been renamed. Same thing goes for the servers also. People do golden images. And uh, the reason why I mention this is because when you pass the hash, Microsoft actually fixed this last year so you can't pass the hash uh, using you know, local accounts except for the 500 account. That's the reason why you need to know the 500 account. So when we talk about pass the hash sequence, what happens is usually there's a compromise that comes to, that uses, uh, that hits one of your clients. Um, I use the so social engineering toolkit so I owe Dave a hug and a beer in a bar just so you guys know. Um, basically, um, if you use, uh, so what happens is after you do a compromise, they're going to elevate privileges, right? They're going to go from the user, because usually when you do a compromise, the compromise usually takes uh, place in the security context of the user. The attacker is then going to elevate privileges, scrape hashes, and do recon at that time too, okay? Once he's done the recon, so on the recon, he's going to try to either enumerate the domain or find out places where he wants to, you know, pass the hash to. Uh, once you pass the hash to the next boss you do, what you're going to do next is, you know, you're going to do the same thing that you usually do, which is elevate privilege, create passes, and recon. On all these boxes that you pass through, here are some op uh, optional stuff. Leave back, you know, you can leave back doors just in case you want to visit that box again. And you can crack hashes. Cracking hashes, yeah, they're kind of cool cracking hashes. Once you've done all of these events, what, they're prep what you're prepping for is the final assault. The final thing you want to do is you want to get a domain admin hash. You want to pass that hash to the domain controller. Once you're on the domain controller, what you're going to do is you're going to extract the Active Directory. Once you've extracted the Active Directory, you can, do what, you can do some really cool attacks such as golden tickets and skeleton key attacks. And those are like what I think of them as ultimate persistent attacks. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to pull out my video here and I'm hoping that it's going to show um, ‑‑ let's see. I'm going to try to put it full screen so maybe you guys can see it. Is it not working? Can you guys see the words that I'm typing out there? I mean that the, uh, on the video or ‑‑ no? Or is it good? Okay, so, so, uh, so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to play it as fast as I can. Uh, so the demo on this thing, because the resolution is not as good as it should be, full screen it. Uh, okay. No, that's, that was full screen. <laughs> Okay, that's about as full as it's going to get for me. Sorry, guys. So basically what I've done is that I've already compromised the box. I go in through my back door. What my back door does is that it's kind of like a sticky key thing or a, it's, a narrow, it's a variation of it. So as you can tell, there's still, you know, I RDP through the box and I get a shell. Every time I RDP through the box and I do cert certain keystrokes, I'll get a shell. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to try to extract the hashes, okay? So when I try to extract the hashes, I have a script on the box that I pre-put on there that I 
put on the boxes. Uh, I have these videos, by the way, so you guys can see it. Uh, it's posted to my friend's website at the end of this, so you guys can actually see it. And I, I do narrate on it what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. But so what I do is I, you know, I, I run my script. It dumps the hashes. I'm going to notice that, hey, I don't have the domain admin hash. Okay. So what I do is I say, okay, let's put the domain admin hash on that box, and I log in as the domain admin on one of these boxes. So once I log in as the domain admin, what's going to happen is I'm going to go back to my Kali box and I'm going to scrape the hash again. And once I scrape the hash, it's going to be, it's going to show that it's there. What you should have seen, been seeing is that 500 thing. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't show it to you. Um, so basically when I run the hash scraper again, this time it's going to show up and I'm going to grab that hash. Yeah, so I really apologize that you guys can't see it, but then basically it's going to grab, you know, it's going to show the hash over there. At that point, I'm going to grab the hash, and then once I grab that hash, let me stop this. There's this script from Core Impact, these Python scripts that you can use. And what I do is I got the hashes. I hope, hopefully you guys can see these hashes a little bit clearer. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a tool from Core Impact. And then what it's going to do is that it's going to pass that hash of the, of the I'm a domain admin account to the domain controller. Once it does that, what's going to happen is that, you know, I'll be able to extract the Active Directory information database. Uh, the way that this particular script does it is that it goes through the Valium shadow copy and once again we can't see nothing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things that I was going to talk about, if you listen to the video, um, I'm going to talk about something called the KRB TGT account. What this account does is that it creates, the hash of it creates all the Kerberos tickets so once somebody gets on top of your domain controller, they can actually, once they have this hash, they can make golden tickets which, where they can impersonate any particular, any user in your network and you will never know anything about it. So basically once the attacker gets to your domain controller, it's over. It's pretty much over. Your domain's unreliable. Um, you know, Microsoft won't come out and say it, but you know, you can reset, you can do some things, but then there's other things, you, there's other attacks you can do so that you can maintain persistence in the domain once you get to the domain controller. Um, I'm just going to skip these videos already because I can't see nothing. Okay, so okay, so at this point, I'm just going to ta start talking about forensic evidence. So there's two types of forensic evidence out there. You got volatile and non-volatile. Uh, evidence. Volatile stuff is when you turn off the PC, it's gone forever. You know, so when you go to a PC that, you know, or a server that you're going to grab evidence from, at the very least, you know, these are some of the very least things that I usually grab. The best thing is grabbing the RAM, doing RAM cap or, you know, uh, hibernating the box so you get a hyperfill.sys file. Uh, if it's a VMware image, you could actually suspend the VM and use the VM uh, file for it. For non-volatile stuff, uh, at the very least, event logs, registry, system info. Best, get a disk image. That's one of the best things to grab for non-volatile stuff. Uh, for VMware, just grab the VMDK. For the analysis tools for volatile stuff, uh, I've used the uh, FD Pro and Mandiant Memorize to dump memory. There's a bunch of other tools out there if you look at memory dumpers. Uh, to analyze memory, volatility. Cool. It's free. It's great. Um, it's the right size to actually do a lot of most of the analysis for most of the stuff that you need. Volatility is great. If you need to go deeper, HP Gary Responder Pro, very expensive program, but 
Like I said, most of the work you can do, you can, you know, most of the IOCs you want to find, you can find it with volatility. And it's free. So $10,000, free. <laughs> okay, so um, creating list, uh, disk images, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people will just, you know, will just pull out the disk. You can use Linux, you know, to do it. Use DD to just, you know, grab the image of it. Really nice. Or you can use NCase or FTK Imager. Those things are nice also. Uh, to analyze it, you know, sleuth kit, autopsy, log to time. I kind of like log to timeline. It's great. Puts everything together for you. Uh, NCase and FTK, those are pricey things again. <laughs> now then, um, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start showing you guys what kind of pieces of evidence you're going to find as you go through, you know, those stages that I talked about, like the compromise stage and all those other stages. So for this one over here, the compromise stage, Windows Security Event Log, Process Auditing Success. If you guys turn this on, this is what you'll see. Anytime somebody does something, you'll see them, you'll see a, you'll see a process creation followed by, hey, who created that process? And what's the image of it right here? What was the name of the file that was executed? This is really cool because from this one over here, this was when I used Kali, I believe, to create a, you know, to create a interpreter shell. That's what it looks like. You know, left this artifact out there. Um, for the compromise part too, what you can do is you can look at the disk for something called a prefetch. Every time a computer uh, program runs, a disk artifact is created in the prefetch for client systems. For server systems, they don't use prefetch. If you got an SSD on a client system, there will be no prefetch. I mean, there'll be the prefetch directory, but there will be no artifacts. Okay. For this one that we're here, for this example, this is what uh, this is what it looks like in end case for me when I look at it. You can uh, here's the the uh, mace entries over there for the timestamps, and if you look on the left side, you'll see that hey, ping was run along with PowerShell. That might be normal for some systems, but if it's, you're talking about your admin assistant running these programs, that's bad. Uh, another thing that you can talk about, so like if you don't have the prefetch, how can you prove that something ran on your system? Shim cache. It's, also, it's actually called the application compatibility cache, but they nickname it the shim cache. The reason why it's, uh, the reason why it's nicknamed the shim cache is because of what it does. When a program executes, when you want to execute a program, uh, the operating system takes a look at it and tries to shim it to work with the current operating system. Now this shimming process is saved in memory, okay? It's usually saved in memory. Once the system powers down gracefully, notice the word gracefully, that part of memory is purged to disk, to the registry. Okay? So what you can do is you can parse it using volatility if it's still in memory and if the system's been shut down already, you can use something like called RegRipper. RegRipper is a, uh, it's a bunch of Perl scripts out there. It's free. Free. Free is good. And this is what it looks like in uh, RegRipper over here. Uh, it's pretty cool because so this one over here, it was from, what was this one from? I think this was also from when I used Metasploit. On this one over here, you can see that the program, you know, this uh, it tells you that this executable with this right here, with this time, was executed on the system. So that's one of those things that gives you proof that, hey, this actually ran on your system. <clears throat> so another thing that you can use with the vol is volatility is this thing called the malfine command. It's a pretty cool program. Uh, pretty cool part the volatility is that it goes, it goes through uh, walking the bad tree looking for executables. Okay, so an MZ header, for, for people that don't know, MZ means that it's an executable, uh, it's executable. So what we have here is a program with something injected into it. You know, so the first part, it's kind of, it's already hokey to begin with, and the second part is that inside this hokey program, it's executable. There's another program uh, nested within it. Okay, so these things are pretty cool because a lot of times if you, uh, if you use certain programs, you'll find it like uh, in DL host or SVC host. You'll see if somebody process hollowed and they put a program in there, you'll see that MG header. Okay, uh, backdoors. A lot of times I've seen, what I've seen is that for backdoors, some people, what they do is they just 
you know, they don't want to do anything special, don't want to put any malware in the system, so what do you do? Make a user on the system. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but uh, one of these things is that you can make a user and just say, get into the system later, I'll make a local user. A lot of people, making a domain user is hard, making local user, easy, because you've already compromised the system. What this log entry will tell you is, hey, which user created the back door and gives you the time and date stamp? So that's pretty cool. You know, so, you know, a lot of people, uh, some people will do this just to get around security. Another thing that a lot of malware tends to do is they tend to put run keys out there. Uh, what the run keys will do is that uh, when the system starts up, it will execute their malware to, you know, do whatever it needs to do, like call home or, you know, open another port or something, you know. Uh, another thing that uh, happens also is that uh, a lot of people like to uh, install services on the system so that when the services are on the system, uh, what we can do is we can use RegRipper to find out, hey, when's the last time these services were created? And that, in this way, we can find any of the back doors that get left behind as, as the attacker is passing their hash through. A lot of times you just can't pass the hash in one day. That's why they're called APTs. They take several months to just keep on winding and winding through your network. Okay, so when I talk about privilege escalation, we're talking about going all the way to the local system account. So usually when you get, when you pop a box using a Java exploit or if a user clicks on, you know, hey, your UPS bill has arrived.exe, you know, you, uh, usually they're users, right? You're in the user context. So what you have to do is you sometimes have to privilege escalate to the administrator account and from the administrator account you can privilege escalate all the way to the local system account. Once you're in the local system account, you'll be able to scrape hashes. You have to be, you can't be an administrator, you got to be the system account to scrape those hashes. <clears throat> because of that, oh, by the way, somebody once asked me how to do it in Cali. So I actually put this in the slide deck. So if anybody wants to, basically uh, you'll have to pop the box first, but uh, once you're a user, you can do these steps to escalate yourself all the way up to system. Okay, so for privilege escalation, this is what it looks like when you privilege escalate on the system. This event ID by itself is not bad. You know, basically when you, when you privilege escalate, you'll get a 4611 from the consent UI and you know, you get this little detail thing here over here. By itself, it's not bad. When you patch your systems, you'll see this. Now the trick is looking at it to say, hey, I got this, but where's my patching? And that's when you start looking for those artifacts to find out, hey, why did the consent UI get popped? You know, so those are the things like, so forensically, you know, there's not one thing that says this, you see this thing, it's bad. It doesn't work that way. You have to look at it and check the context of it. <clears throat> um, on this one over here is where I'm scraping the hashes using something called the Windows Credential Editor. Okay, so a lot of people that are pen testers, um, they like to use other people's tools but they don't understand what happens behind the scenes. So if you have advanced logging, what happens is that certain artifacts get uh, left in the event log. On this one over here, whenever you run the Windows Credential Editor, something gets left in the system event log, an event ID 7045. Uh, and when you do that, it will tell you, hey, service got installed running under the context of the local system. And it will also tell you what program is it pointing at to run. So just remember that, you know, when somebody's running like off the shelf malware, like Windows Credential Editor, you'll see these type of artifacts getting populated into your event log. But also just remember though, in order to see this, you have to turn on, turn up the logging from the default. If you don't turn up the logging from the default, you will never see this event ID. Ooh. Keep talking. Okay, okay. I will not break with tradition. I don't see anybody <laughs> okay. So once, once the, uh, so when they run the Windows Credential Editor, they'll see the service being installed, the service starting, and the uh, service stopping. So what they're doing is they're scraping the hashes. If you look at it though, they're doing it as the system account. And so when they do it as the system account, what happens is that 
you know, but like I said before, you have to scrape hashes as a system. Holy Me shit. Yes, Mimi Cats. One of my favorite tools. And I'm supposed to be a white hat. <laughs> but Mimi Cats is a really cool tool. Okay, if anybody has ever used Mimi Cats, you know you can scrape hashes with it, right? Like over here, when I used Mimi Cats, I got the I'm a user, Ono's, and his hash, right? His NTLM hash. Now it's time to stop talking. Okay. Here we go. Give me that. All right, who knows what's going on here? So, so we understand that it is your first time speaking at DEF CON. Yes, it is. Well, congratulations. It's very tough to get in here. So how about a round of applause for the new speaker? Now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> really? Wow. Nope, not getting it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so with Mimi Cats, it's a pretty cool tool. Um, when you use volatility, one of the cool things you can do is there's this command called the consoles command. It's just like you're sitting right behind the person and watching everything they're typing. Okay? He just went on like nothing happened. That's just amazing. <laughs> He'll be coming back, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, so these tools, by the way, uh, you can find them. If you just, you know, if you just uh, Google it, you can find it. You will, uh, however, need to turn off the malware prevention part on your Google Chrome or your Firefox. They will not let you download this thing for some odd reason. One of the cool things about this is, like I said, though, is that it'll scrape, it'll go through memory, it'll scrape stuff for you. One of the things, the additional things that I've seen Mimikatz do that is really awesome is that it'll scrape something, a process called the W Digest process. The W Digest process, if you'll notice here, I got that user, here's my user, here's my domain, but look, there's my password, it's not cryptid. So it's gonna play, it, you know, Mimikatz has, Mimikatz has the ability to scrape plain text passwords from your system. So if you ever see Mimi Cats on your system, ah, okay. And uh, please notice that on the consoles command, uh, Mimi, when you run Mimi Cats, it goes into its own shell. Notice that the consoles command actually shows you what's going on inside that shell. So that's one of the cool things about the consoles command. Um, another thing that, remember when I said about one of the optional activities you guys can do is crack hashes? Many, many years ago, I used John the Ripper, which is a CPU cracker. It took one weekend to crack a nine pa character password, which is, which was, and it was a simple one too. And it was, it, it just took one whole week and I was like, oh my God, that, that, that's too long. And then I discovered something called OCL Hashcat. OCL Hashcat, Here's the numbers off their box. If you use an Ubuntu 14.4 box using eight uh, radions, eight of those radions, each radion is about 500 bucks. So if you think about it, for about 10 to 20 grand, you can crack hashes at 183 trillion times cracks per second. That's awesome. To put into context, eight character passwords, nine hours with just one box. If you, build a, if you have a cluster of these boxes, do a, what they call a meet in the middle attack. Nine character, uh, eight character passwords, really quick. There's also rainbow tables out there for these eight character passwords. So scale it up to what a nation state could do and how fast they could crack something. And you start to see that this is, this is kind of bad. <laughs> okay, so on this one over here, I use the um, consoles and command scan again to find how I recon the boxes. So when I did a re, as soon as I uh, compromised the box, what I did is I looked at certain artifacts on the box. You know, just because you have somebody's hash, you need to know, hey, where, where can I pass this guy's hash to, right? Some of the things I looked at is something called a default.rdp. Default.rdp saves the last place you actually RDP to. 
Why is that important? Well, think about it this way. If you can RDP into a box, more than likely you are the administrator of that server. And that's why, that's one of the things that I do as a, you know, as, a, as somebody that's doing recon. Uh, another thing that I look at is I look at shares. If I see you mapped to a, you know, a, you know, a dollar sign share, you're probably admin on that box. So that's the box that I probably want to pass my hash to. Uh, another thing that I usually do is, you know, I enumerate the domain and I try to find out where every single domain controller is. In this environment, there's only one domain controller. So, you know, it just shows up over here and it tells me it's the PDC emulator. So there's these five boxes, uh, there's these five roles for, uh, that Windows administrators know about. It's called the FISMO, FISMO roles, flexible single master of operations roles. One of them is the PDC emulator. If you're going to do a skeleton key attack, the PDC emulator is the best place to do it from because uh, what skeleton key attack does is that basically everybody has two passwords, <laughs> their own and the password that I set. And this is the best plan. Usually it, it, once you do a skeleton key attack, you get all these replication issues, but if you do it from the PDC emulator, eh, less chance of that. <clears throat> and one of my friends, I want to say where he's from, he actually showed me an APT, you know, some of the commands that the APTs used to do. This is kind of dated, it's 2011 from the timestamp on the side. But if you look at the commands that they're doing, what the APT is doing is that they are looking at the domain, they're enumerating the domain, they're finding out who the domain admins are. You want to find those out. You want to find out where every controller is. You want to find out every computer out there and every user out there. You know, because if you can find all the users and all that, you can find which people, you know, which, uh, which commands are admins and stuff like that. So this is some of the things that people do for recon. All these commands, by the way, do not work on a Windows 7 box anymore. But you can still PowerShell and get the same things from, you can still PowerShell on a Windows 7 box and get all this information here that this thing was doing. Okay? <clears throat> Lateral movement. So some of the things that we do once somebody has compromised the box and passes hashes, they look like any other user. You know, so that's the bad thing. Once they grab your hash, they look like you. They are you for all intents and purposes. So you could get, you know, who knows, you could get busted for doing something you never did. Somebody can impersonate you. Once they have your hash, they can do whatever you can do. They can read your email for all I care. If you look at this one over here, the event ID 4624 logon, when you log into a system, you get these type, logon types. Type 2 is interactive. 3 network logins. So like, here's one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that on the domain controllers, it makes it really hard because when you log, every time you log into the, the domain controller, what happens is that you have to get into the scripts directory to run the login scripts. That results in a type 3 login on the domain controller. So it makes it really hard if you're trying to trace if, an, if it's the person logging in or if it's a real attacker doing stuff on your domain controller. Um, also another thing too is that if you RDP into the box, it's a type 10. So a lot of people like to do RDP pivots. Once you crack hashes, RDP pivoting is the way to go because if you think about it, your IDS is not going to catch ID, you know, RDP. That's normal. That's normal background stuff. So a lot of times, a lot of people, what, they, what I've seen, a lot of attackers, what I've seen them do is if they can get your, if they can crack your credentials and pass, you know, they don't need to pass hash, they can just pivot using RDP. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about is on this one over here, it'll tell you which workstation you came in from. So, and you know, what IP. So that's how you can track, you can backtrack their lateral movement. Okay, uh, there's these other logs in Microsoft land. Usually people think of logs as security application and system logs. Microsoft introduced a bunch more logs. And some of these logs, uh, I have it listed over here, but what they list is when you RDP into a box, they'll tell you who the user is, and here's the important part right here. They'll tell you what IP address they came from. So that's another way you can trace when somebody's pivoting in your network. Uh, another thing too is that with the RDP pivots, they, they tend to leave artifacts behind. 
So if you got a person that's never ever used RDP before, when they use RDP, a default.rdp file gets created, and in there it lists down the last IP that they RDP to. So in that case, you know, you can find out where they've been to. You can also look at something called shell bags, which is, I won't get into it. Uh, what the shell bags can do is that they'll tell you, uh, you ever notice that when you RDP to another, you know, you keep on RDPing, all these shortcuts get created? Well, same thing happens to an attacker that's using your box. All these shell bags get created so you can find out where they've been. Uh, and lastly, the last thing I'm going to talk about is something called the BMC cache. A lot of people don't know about this one, but when you RDP to a box, one of the things that it does is that it stores these bitmap images so that it doesn't have to send it all over again. What we can do is we can actually parse that, that file and take a look at that picture of what the attacker was looking at. So I actually grabbed one of these pictures over here from, you know, from something that I've seen before. And you can tell over here, this is, this is prime for an attacker, right? Remember the thing I said about the, the, the dollar sign shares and the, uh, the dollar sign shares? The next thing, if I saw this picture on a box that was compromised, I'm going to look at those boxes because they're most likely been compromised also. The attacker, you know, we got pictures here that shows that the attacker might have been there. Um, another thing too is that you see the C users user directory over there? Hey, if they switched user context, we could catch them. And if you look at the bottom, that's somebody's inbox in Microsoft Outlook. So that means that the attacker was reading that guy's email. <laughs> so <coughs> in closing, these are some of the artifacts you can find when you pass the hash. You know? Hopefully if there's one thing that you want to take away from this is turn up logging. If you leave it at the default, you'll never see if somebody's going through your network. How much time do I have left? Seven minutes? Okay, any questions? Uh, no, then you'd privilege escalate up. No, you can. So what you would do is you would find a way to get from user to admin. You know, you, you might use a zero day or some other thing to, to move up to become an admin on that box and then move all the way up to local system. So just, it does help though. I'm going to tell you right now, taking admin, making, making sure that all your users are not admins on their boxes really helps a lot. Most malware over there, they're scripted so that they take advantage of the fact that most people are lazy and are admins on their boxes. So if you take, like for all my kids in, my, in their network, in my network at home, none of them have admin. I don't have admin. And so, you know, I don't have admin, I don't have Flash, I don't have Java on mine. Everything I do, <laughs> yeah, everything I do is in a VM. Everything I do is in a VM. When I'm done looking at the stuff I need to look at, I roll it back. Now as far as the privilege escalation goes, yeah, it really helps, but to a determined attacker, it will not stop them. But it really helps against things like, you know, if you're going against, you know, people that use, you know, automated malware, like, you know, like Zeus and stuff like that, you know, banking malware, they usually don't go that extra step to make sure that they can, you know, compromise you beyond user. So which is good. Uh, yes, over here. Uh, Is what? Laps. Oh, uh, I've never used that. I've used Emmet. That probably works pretty good. Um, how good is it to use laps, right? Oh, how, how efficient of a countermeasure it is to use laps? Laps is pretty good. You know, from what he's, you've been explaining to me, it's a group policy that scrambles the local administrator account, right? So if it scrambles the local administrator account, basically you can't pass hash from workstation to workstation because the 500 account, the one that at the local admin account, it's scrambled. But then that means also that nobody else can use it if it's scrambled. Okay, and like a lot of people that are in IT, some odd reason they kind of fixate on that 500 account and they kind of like it. And that's, that's one of the bad things. 
Oh, uh, last, last question right there. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I haven't been an admin for a while, so. <laughs> okay, and that concludes my thing. I think I'm out of time. Thank you for coming to listen to me.